Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, I think Therese is going to get us started off uh, just going over a, first a specimen record that has geology attached to it. Yeah, can everybody hear me now? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. <laughs> um, okay, so first thing I want to do is show you a record that has some geology associated with its locality. So in this um, record, we can see the typical things that you have associated with your catalog record, identification, collector, parts, etc. Um, the geology is associated with the location. So for this location, we have quite a few geology attributes that you can see down at the bottom here. Um, some of these are typical geology, and some of them are what we're going to eventually refer to as locality attributes. But the geology that you can see with this locality is the land vertebrate phonicron here, this stage age, and the formation. So these are some of the geology terms that we'll be talking about um, when we look at the code table. So how do all these attributes get added to the locality? Um, oh, darn. Let me get signed in here so that I can show you. I had a minor malfunction just before this and got logged out of everything, apparently. So we'll go back to the record we were looking at. And now that I'm logged in, you can see I have little edits next to everything so that I can change things. So we will edit the locality on this. And you can see this locality has 15 records associated with it. So um, before editing any localities in Arctos, it's always good to make sure that you're not affecting somebody else's specimens um, in a way that they may not want. These are all in our collection, and I know they all belong in this locality, so I feel comfortable editing it. Um, there's all of the locality fields, and then as you scroll down to the bottom, you get to the geology attributes. So. Not only could I add an attribute here, but I can edit the ones that are already there if I need to. I'll scroll down to the very bottom so that you can kind of see both. Um, if I wanted to edit one of these, I would just make my edit wherever I needed it and select Save Changes. If I want to add a new geology attribute, I can pick the one I would like to add. So these are the attribute types that are available to me. Once you pick one of these, um, you're then provided with a drop down list of the terms that are available in that attribute type. So it helps cut down on um, errors in typing and um, or putting a formation when it should be a member or something like that. Um, you don't have to complete the determiner and determine date fields, but um, if you know who decided um, why this geology attribute should be attached to this locality, it's always good to record as much information about that as possible. And then once you have set up what you want, um, you just select create determination, and then this attribute will be added to the locality. Um, you can get to the locality many ways in Arctos, but usually when you're going to add an attribute like this, um, you wind up going from a specimen record, at least I do. But you can also search locality, find the locality directly, and get to this exact same screen. 
So that's how the attributes get added to the localities. So um, I think the next thing we want to talk about is the code oh. tables that provide. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Did somebody have a question? Um, okay, so we wanted to go through the code tables that provide the drop downs that I showed you um, when adding things. So um, the code tables are all found, I'll do that from here, um, search code table. And then these are all geology attributes. So that's this code table that we're going to be looking at here. Um, right now the code table is quite large because we have all of the attributes in one code table. Um, we will be working with the programmer to kind of break these up a little um, and make the code table less unwieldy. But um, we're going to go through the terms that are on there now, and I'm going to turn it over to Nicole so she can kind of talk about them. So um, right now we're looking at the chronostratigraphy section of the code table. We have several different types of geology in this code table. So um, starting out with chronostratigraphy, um, also with the, the geochronology units in there, so Eon and Eonathem. Um, so everything under Chronostratigraphy, International Commission on Stratigraphy, is um, from the International Chronostratigraphic Chart. And so everything that's entered on this table has to be in that chart so that we can keep keep that table really controlled. Um, and then below that, we have a new section that we put in there um, that we've called regional chronostratigraphy. Um, let me wait a second for Teresa to get there. There we go. Sorry about that. No problem. So in here, this is regional terms, but also older terms that are no longer used in the international chart. Um, so you can see Precambrian is in there. Um, that's not a term that's in the chart, but that's really used really frequently. Um, and then we have, like I said, some regional terms. So these are these are probably published um, and have been used in the scientific literature and are useful in some way to scientists, but since they're regional terms, they're not in the international chart. So this is kind of our overflow area for things that are useful but um, aren't actually in that international chronostratigraphic chart. Uh, the next type of geology we have in there is the lithostratigraphy. So these are your groups, formations, members, um, beds if they're named and described. And we are starting to get more strict a little bit about what goes in here. Um, we're wanting to make sure that anything we put in here is actually published and described in some way in the literature um, so that we don't get terms that are just someone made it up off the top of their head or they, they it was in someone's dissertation but it was never actually published. Um, so we're trying to make sure that everything in here is published um, and if you'll notice we've started putting links to sources on the, the right here. Um, and that's part of what we're doing to make sure everything in there is actually something that's been used. The next, the next session is um, bio, biochronology. And this is something that um, is newer. Um, 
we've added it in as our museum has started adding records to Arctos. And um, we had a, a big need to put uh, the biochronology in there. Actually, scroll down. There we go. So the, the main one that's going to be used the most down here is land mammal ages. Um, those are super commonly used, um, especially the North American land mammal ages. Above that, we have land vertebrate phonicrons, which are not as widely used, but um, they're used a lot in our collection, so that's why those are in there. Um, and then above that, we have biostratigraphy. Um, this is biozones, so it's um, units of rock defined by which fossils they have in them. Um, so your ammonite zones um, and any other fossils that, you know, have been described as some sort of biozone. So we've got ammonites in there, um, trilobites, uh, some mammals. And then below, below all of these uh, strictly geology terms, um, if you're looking through the code table, you notice we have a, a bunch of other uh, locality-related information. Um, and this is because as our collection has started to move into Arctos, we realized that as a paleontology collection, we have a lot more information associated with localities than I think other types of collections. Um, and so we've devised a solution. And basically, that's, that is that we are going to expand geology attributes and um, generalize that into locality attributes. So that's what Teresa was saying earlier about splitting up that table. So we'll split up all of those different kinds of geology and then we'll add in uh, these other attributes related to localities. So for example, we've got public land survey coordinates. Um, we'll have other information like the landowners, site identifiers, site found by date. Um, these will be really, this type of information is heavily used in paleontology, but is also going to be useful to other types of collections to be able to associate associate that type of data with the locality. And at the same time, by doing it as an attribute, we're not undermining the current model of a locality in Arctos, which is simply um, basically a coordinate data, um, just a place on the surface of the Earth. Um, and that's all I have about the, the code table, Teresa. Is there anything else you want to add in? Um, so everybody close your eyes while I scroll to the bottom. Um, <laughs> well, it's probably not right at the bottom anymore. Um, our, one of our last attributes that we added um, is called um, access, and it's the only thing you can select there is private. Um, and when you add that geology attribute to a locality, it effectively encumbers the entire locality. So if you do not have um, access in Arctos to a collection, um, when you are not logged in, you will not see that locality either by searching localities or on any specimen record that is assigned to that locality. Um, and we did this because um, we have certain obligations to both federal and private lands to ensure that there's not fossil poaching. And so these localities need to remain um, opaque. So for the specimen records where we have these private localities, um, you can see, I'll go back to this first one we were looking at. Um, and this one, we haven't added the research locality. So the locality that has all of the detailed information, the only one we have is the public. 
and you can see it's very vague. All we're offering up is county information um, and certain information about the locality attributes, so the stratigraphy and um, who found it and when and if there are any numeric identifiers related to it. Um, but this keeps it very vague for public use. Um, so that one attri geology attribute of private um, really does um, keep the, the locality hidden. So by having those, those two localities, the private one and the public one, that are, are mirrors of each other, um, we can control it very specifically what information gets shared with the public. So we can share as much or as little information as we want. Yeah, it's definitely more powerful than the just um, locality encumbrance that you can use in Arctos, which will only really encumber coordinates. And because we have so much information um, related to these localities that could allow people to find it even without coordinates, we needed something a little more powerful. And so um, that's what we've worked out to help us keep the sort of research identity of these locations um, hidden from the public. So next we'd like to talk about how you search for geology um, when you're looking for specimens. So this is the, the regular, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so this is, of course, the, the main locality search page. Um, if you go under locality and click on uh, show more options, you will see um, the, loca or the geology um, fields for searching. So you can click on geology attribute and it'll come up with the, the different kinds of units we have in there. So for example, era, land mammal age, um, series, epoch. And you can click on whichever field you want to search in. And then under value, you type in the value that you want to search for. But the, the final thing that you want to pay attention to is this traverse geology hierarchies. That's really important because if you remember back in the code table, um, we've organized the different geology attributes in hierarchies. So for example, if you do a search for Mesozoic, um, if you have traverse hi geology hierarchies as yes, then it will also find things in the Cretaceous or Jurassic or Triassic. If you don't have that traverse hierarchies on, it won't go down into that hierarchy. So you'll only find things that are listed as Mesozoic and it won't come up with things that are lower down in that hierarchy. So that's very important to pay attention to you, pay attention to when you're doing that geology search. Um, another thing that we have not worked out yet, but we are, have plans on doing, um, is there is, if you go to search, you can search places um, currently, you do not have the option to uh, search by a geology attribute under that place search, um, but that is something that we plan on uh, getting put into place. So actually, it kind of is in here now. Oh, it did get in there. Yeah, Never mind. Um, under the, yep. <laughs> yeah, you Never can mind. do the same kind of search here. Okay, yeah. You can pick whichever, put your attribute, and you can also traverse. So it's kind of hidden down at the bottom of the um, places search. 
Yes, it is hidden. I was looking at it earlier and I didn't see it. <laughs> okay, but it is down in there. Yeah. Yep. Super hidden. <laughs> okay, so um, let's talk about adding um, terms to the code table. Um, this the geology code table will be treated just like any other of our code tables here. Um, and if there's a term that you need added, um, you would use the GitHub to request an authority and enter all the information you need. The geology terms um, require a term and a definition and um, Usually what we have been doing for the definition, as you can see in the code table here, is a link to um, the source for the, for the term. Um, so that's all you would need to do to request a term. And once it's approved by the community, it'll get added to the code table. Um, but I think Nicole has some, uh, yeah. wants to offer up some sources for when you're looking for terms. Yeah, so the reason, um, well, I mean, the part of this, part of doing that GitHub issue is to give um, that a chance to be reviewed so we can make sure that, you know, this is indeed a, a published rock unit. Um, and it's helpful when you're doing that GitHub issue to um, go ahead and track down a, a source for that term. Um, some sources that I like to use, there's one called Macrostrat, which um, actually pulls the geology terms out of the literature and breaks it down kind of on a regional level um, so that you can see which units are when it, in which areas. Um, the other source that I like to use um, is Geolex, the National Geologic Map Database. This is a, a database maintained by the um, United States Geological Survey. And you can, if you, Teresa, can you scroll down? Um, they've got a search box there that says unit name. Um, so you can just type in the, the name of the lithostratigraphic unit you're looking for. And, um, and if it's in that database, it will, it usually says, says something about kind of the regional usage, like which states does this occur in, um, and it'll have, may have a little bit of history, the publication history. So you can see here that the Gila formation occurs in Arizona and New Mexico. Um, And if you scroll down, it should uh, list any significant publications. So these are, um, well, this one doesn't actually have any, but if it, it will often list publications where the, the publication where the unit was named um, and publications where the unit was revised. The other option is to just use your favorite, favorite academic search engine to look for publications. Um, that can be really useful if it's a term that doesn't come up in either of these um, and you're trying to figure out where it came from, what the history of it is, um, doing that sleuthing in the, the um, literature can be helpful. Um, so, Teresa, anything else to add on that? No, I think that's for sources. That's what I go to. Mm -hmm. So the next thing we wanted to talk about was um, moving forward. Um, we um, have been starting to have conversations about how to make sure that the geologic information gets passed on to the data aggregators in an optimal way. Um, one example right now of kind of how our data mismatches Darwin Core um, comes in using uh, ranges, geology ranges. 
say for example, you have a specimen um, and the data you have with it says it's from, it's uh, found anywhere from the, let's say, let me look, pull up this chart. Say it's found anywhere from the, the Cinemanian to the Campanian. Um, in Arctos, the way you would indicate that is when you add those geology attributes, you're going to add Cinemanian, Turonian, Coniacian, Santonian, and Campanian. So you're going to add each of those individually. And that helps with searches because that way if you search for any of those, it's going to come up because it's in that range. However, Darwin Core um, works a little bit differently. It's got um, fields for an upper unit and a lower unit. And so right now our data currently doesn't translate over to that. So part of what we're going to be doing moving forward is figuring out how the best way to um, walk that data over to Darwin Core for the data aggregators. Yeah, and I think we've um, definitely had discussions about, at least for the chronostratigraphy, um, having the numerical ages associated with the terms in the code table could facilitate that. So these are all conversations that are still going on. And if you um, feel like you have something to add, you're welcome to jump into GitHub and uh, toss in your opinions. Yeah, and um, yeah, just definitely. to pause, we've had a few questions that might be worth answering now versus waiting, um, if you don't okay. mind. Um, so the first one was from Greg. He was asking if, um, do you enter all PLSS data along with the coordinates at, um, at your institution? So right now we are um, entering the PLS, PLSS data. Um, and the reason that we wanted to add that data into Arctos, even though it's an older coordinate system that's not used as much, um, our, a lot of our collaborators, for example, um, we get uh, paleontology mitigation groups. I might get a request from one of them that says we've got a project going in um, you know, this township and range, can you give me the spec all the specimens that are in that township and range? And it's a whole lot easier to fulfill that request if we are actually able to search on that township range data. So that's the reason that we wanted to go ahead and make sure that got added into Arctos is that we're still using, um, still using that data and we needed it to be searchable. So it is, right now it's being added into the geology code table and eventually it will get broken out as a locality attribute. Gotcha, that makes sense. And then um, Anna had a question, are private access localities completely hidden from the public? Are these stored as separate events? Or rather, does adding the private access attribute hide the entire specimen event that the locality is associated with? So Tracy, do you want to get that one? Hide the entire. Yeah, yeah. Um, it does hide the entire event. So um, it would also hide if there were media associated with the event. That would be hidden as well. Um, so essentially anything associated with the locality also becomes private. Great, and looks like so, Anna 
seems like are following up too. Yeah. So, so for those records where we do have the private locality, um, they do have two events. There's the public event and the private event. Okay, it looks like several people are typing, but um, just to mention, Greg had asked about um, GitHub, and so that's just the platform that um, Arctos users to um, create any issues or um, make requests to add any attributes or vocabulary to code tables. Yeah, if you want to show that, Teresa, and just talk about sort of the process for adding um, requested code table vocabulary. Yep. So in GitHub, we have our issues, which is where we're talking about all these different things. Um, to add a new request for an authority, um, whenever you add a new issue, you, you're offered some templates here. And so the authority request one here is what you would use to um, add a new code table request. Um, we also organize these a little bit by projects. And so there's the paleo collection issues, which a lot of these um, geology code table things will wind up in there too, because we want the paleo people to talk about them. But we also have a project for code table management, which is where we coordinate all of the requests for changes to code tables. Great. Um, okay, looks like that's it. Thanks. Yeah, so um, the other thing that I wanted to point out to everybody is our documentation related to geology, which you can, from Arctos search, you can do the about help and select help. And you'll get to all of our documentation. So um, the documentation is often more technical, sort of describing what everything is. And um, in here under place, we have a section for geology. And this will perhaps in a little more detail describe the things that Nicole and I have talked about today in the code table and um, how the code table works and how the geology attribute works. Um, and then also, in the how-tos, and you can search these over on the side. Oh, that took me right to the documentation. Sorry about that. Um, we have how-tos for creating and managing the terms um, in the code table, and then how to add them to a locality which is probably the one that most people would look for. So um, these are step-by-step -step instructions for adding those geology attributes to a locality. And I think that's mostly what we wanted to cover today. Um, I don't know if there's any more questions because I can't see it, but... It looks like Greg had a couple more questions. Um, the first is, does the formation list cover many states and areas? The answer to that is yes. Um, so again, those the geology gets added on an as-needed basis, particularly the lithostratigraphy. Um, and um, so any lithostratigraphy unit that's supported by um, some sort of publication, uh, we will add into that table. Um, and it does right now cover uh, more than one state and area. Um, I know the University of Alaska has um, over 50,000 specimens in Arctos. Um, and so there's Alaskan lithostratigraphy in there. Um, I think a lot of our New Mexico lithostratigraphy has been added in. Um, and 
their, uh, um, I don't, I guess, uh, University of Texas at El Paso, so there's Texas um, and some Alabama stuff. Um, but again, any new collection that would be coming in from a different area that has um, lithostratigraphy that we don't have in there, um, we would work on getting that added to the table. Uh, Greg's next question was, um, for your federal localities, are all of them marked private and completely not shown at all to the public? Uh, the answer to that is yes. So um, for all of the federal localities, we will have the private locality, which will have all of the specific locality information. And then there will be a public locality that will simply, that will only have geography down to the county level. It will not have specific specific locality. So anything that's like four miles west of this landmark, none of that would be in that public locality. Um, and additionally, um, information like the public land survey coordinates, that wouldn't be in there. Um, no, no geography other than county level information would be in there. Um, the public locality would have um, lithostratigraphy information um, because that can be useful in public searches. And for the most part, um, for the most part, you can't locate a locality by the lithostratigraphy alone. Yeah, so I put an example up, and it's very hard to see, but um, of a record that has both the public and private localities, um, and this is from when I'm logged in, and I've blacked out all the stuff that we're not supposed to be showing to the public. Um, but you can see how um, the one with the access private has a lot more information than the one beneath it, um, which is just shows kind of the bare bones information about the locality. Teresa, can you zoom in on the, the public locality so we can see what information is in there? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to make this happen. There we go, that's a little better. So then you can see in the public what's there. And I had a question about that. So I'm getting some feedback here. Um, so. When instead of, so this would be beneficial instead of using um, our typical encumbrance process because um, for encumbrances, you did mention it can mask coordinates, but there is a mask locality um, option where it does mask below county level, but with using this private tool, it does still show some of those geology attributes and that's the difference, I'm guessing. No, so the difference is that we have two different localities. We have a public and a private. And so in this public one at the bottom, um, we could put whatever we wanted. It's a totally separate locality um, that's just generic. So the reason we didn't want to use the encumber locality is that means there's nothing there to see. Right. Um, and we want, because part of the mission of this museum is to, um, you know, present our collections to the public, we want people to be able to understand what we have and generally where it's from, but not provide enough information so that we're putting these sites at risk. Right. Yep, that makes sense. 
Thanks. Um, and I will enable everyone's microphones. Um, if anyone would like to speak out loud, you can go ahead and do so. Just make sure your microphone icon turns green at the top of your screen. Um, and feel free to keep asking questions in the chat as well. Maybe um, is there a project that you might want, can click on to kind of show how that works um, for folks that aren't familiar with Arctos? Um, well, we've just now started putting these things in, so we haven't really created a project, but I can foresee how we would use um, the projects to um, put things from certain sites together in a more meaningful way or um, things from certain counties and stuff like that. Right. Any questions before we wrap up? Um, I just posted the post uh, webinar survey from IDIG Bio. If you wouldn't mind just taking a minute or two to fill that out, that really provides us with important feedback. Um, and you can suggest future topics that you'd like to delve into um, and provides IDIG Bio some, some basic um, attendee stats. And that would be great if you could fill that out. Looks like might have a question from Erica coming through. Yeah, thank you to Nicole and Teresa. Um, thanks so much. This is sort of an unexplored territory for, for many of us. And so we appreciate you forging well, it's, ahead. I mean, I do feel like, yeah. It's a work in process, so um, anybody who's interested and especially collections that might make use of geology and also the locality at attributes because um, one, of the, one of the things that we didn't really talk about are the fact that paleontologists and archaeologists as well, I believe, will assign numbers to these sites and um, there has already been some discussion at GBIF and IDIGBio, the aggregators, about how to match up sites, um, given that sometimes these sites will have more than one number. It'll, there'll be a collector number and a site number, and then the museum assigns it a number. Um, and for them to be able to match things up across collections amongst these sites. So, um, that's one of the reasons we started looking at locality attributes. Yes, entangling multiple numbering systems, <laughs> a classic trope. <laughs> um, great. <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> If we don't have any more questions, I think we'll um, head out. But thank you, everyone, so much for attending. Um, we'll just make sure Lindsay's typing. Great job. Thanks for all your hard work. So thanks again so much to our presenters, and hopefully we see you next time. Thank you for attending. <laughs>